Good morning, saints. Good morning. morning, sinners. Good morning. We're all here. I want to uh, say uh, thank you to Pastor Dave, Pastor Andy, and Pastor J. Mack for this opportunity to step out of retirement and join you this morning to share the word. This is home for us, and it's just uh, a real a joy and a privilege to, uh, to be here. Our reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All whom the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. I've gotten questions about being retired. I can describe retirement in one word, in Spanish, fantastico. (laughs) Here's my definition of retirement, doing everything I want to do and nothing that I don't. A double negative, but it works for me. So we've been, uh, Avis and I have been doing a lot of walking. Um, We're staying out past nine o'clock on a Saturday night to dance. There's this um, great resource called The Great Courses. Maybe some of you know about it. I didn't until a few weeks into retirement. And you can uh, watch and purchase DVDs on any uh, subject that you can possibly imagine from astronomy to uh, just everything, um, how to uh, draw. So I've been watching video courses on the Old Testament, the New Testament, Reformation history, Uh, It's been a real joy. I'm back here once a week on Tuesdays at noon to uh, teach uh, a Bible study. I have filled in on occasion uh, different Lutheran pastors in the area. You know, they want to go on vacation in the summer, and they've asked me to fill in while they're on vacation. He estado estudiando español por ocho meses ahora. Hablo y entiendo español un poquito, pero quiero hablar y entender español mucho mejor. Intenta, intenta, <coughs> intenta, pero mi cerebro es viejo. <laughs> so in English, I've been studying Spanish for five months now, uh, or, or eight months now. I, I've just been so um, enamored of people who are bilingual. And I've studied lots of languages over the course of my academic life, but I can't speak any of them. So one of my goals in retirement is to uh, learn and speak Spanish. So uh, translating, I speak and understand Spanish a little, but I want to speak and understand Spanish much better. Try, 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 but my brain is old. So all in all, I would say that retirement is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I think most of you know this expression. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But do you know where the expression comes from? The first electric toaster was invented in 1909. And it only toasted on one side of the piece of bread. And you had to be vigilant watching it toast. Because when the one side was toasted, you had to unplug the machine, take the toast out, turn it around, put it back in, plug the toaster back in, and watch that it didn't burn. The first automatic toaster 
was designed by Charles Streit in the year 1919. A man sick and tired of burnt toast. And Americans at first were skeptical in investing any kind of money in a one appliance machine. But prices dropped, sales mushroomed between 1922 and 1930. Sales tripled from 400,000 units to 1.2 million units. Thanks largely in part by coincidence by another invention, the introduction of sliced bread by a company called Wonder. Because before that, bread was uh, sold in whole loaves. I've got two of them, and they've just been uh, baking all morning, and they're done. And if you want a piece of freshly baked bread, they'll be available in the Fellowship Hall uh, after church. America was blown away by the introduction of pre-sliced bread that you could toast and not burn. Hence the expression, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And we're here to talk about bread this morning, the bread of life. Jesus, who says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. The entire sixth chapter of John's gospel is devoted to this one metaphor. Jesus as the bread of life. Jesus as nourishment for our hungry souls. An Armenian Christian says that we Western Christians don't fully grasp and understand what Jesus means when he says, I am the bread of life. Because in the Middle East, bread is not just something that you have in addition to your meal. Bread is the heart and soul of every meal. Many people in the Mideast would not think of taking a fork, a foreign object, and putting it into their mouth. And then to take it out of your mouth and stab another piece of food and put it back into your mouth is unthinkable. Like George Costanza's double dipping the chip Instead, you take a piece of pita bread, which is at the center of the table. You take a piece off, and you use that to pick up and scoop up whatever else there is on the table. So, in Middle East culture, bread is the center and the heart of the table. Jesus used many different metaphors to tell us who he is, right? And this is a wonderful sermon series on Jesus is the door of the sheep and the living water from heaven and the good shepherd of the sheep and the true vine and the way, the truth, and the life and the resurrection and the life. And this morning, there's this wonderful, wonderful image of Jesus being the bread of life. I want to note, first of all, that the bread of life is universal. No one is excluded from enjoying the bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, Jesus says, they will live forever. There's no restriction on the kind of person invited to the table. Jesus invites all to the table. It doesn't make any difference who you are, where you've been at this moment, where you've come from how you got here. There's no official language at the table of Jesus except the language of God's heart broken, broken for us. A respected missionary organization sent a group of translators to a small and remote tribe in South America. And when the translators reached the passage that they were translating in John, I am the bread of life, they realized they had a real problem. Because in this particular culture, there was no flour, there was no yeast, there's no bread. But the translators noticed that this tribe used a special and certain kind of banana leaf to scoop up their food. So to express the meaning of this particular uh, image and to respect the culture to which they were reaching out, they translated this particular sentence to be, I am the banana leaf of life. 
It may sound strange to our ears, but to that culture and that people, it made all the sense in the world. So the bread of life has universal implications for us, but there's also very personal meaning for us. When we come forward for communion today, each of us will be handed a piece of bread and our spiritual forebear, Martin Luther, said that the entire gospel, the entire good news of Jesus is captured in just two words. And those words are, for you. This is the bread of life for you. This is the blood of our Lord for you. If everyone is welcome at the table, then I'm welcome at the table, and you're welcome at the table, and no one is refused, and no one is excluded. There was an article that caught my attention in a Christian magazine recently. The title was, Do This in Random Access Memory of Me. Here's the quote. In June, the Reverend David E. Quarter of the Independent Catholic Church International told the Associated Press that he would soon celebrate Mass online and allow people to take communion by placing unleavened bread in front of their computer screens. So there is absolutely a time and a place for what we Lutherans might call private communion uh, in a hospital room, uh, in a living room, um, in a nursing home. Some of the most meaningful services I've ever participated in have been in those sorts of settings, but weekly, regular communion in front of a computer screen? Do doesn't that take away something fundamental to why we're here today? That we're the church together, celebrating the peace of Christ together, and praying together, and singing together, and worshiping together, and maybe a partnership between Advent Church and Living Word Church. Benjamin Weir, it's a name that you may re remember, this Presbyterian missionary held so long as hostage in Lebanon. He described in such moving terms how he stayed connected to the body of Christ in that cell by himself. That every Saturday night he would set aside a small piece of bread. There was no wine. And on Sunday morning, he would eat that bread and be reminded that he was one in communion with all other Christians throughout the world. And it gave him hope and it strengthened his faith. Bible scholars tell us that when Jesus told his disciples to pray what we call the Lord's Prayer and the petition, give us this day our daily bread, the word daily bread is not found in classical Greek. And for a time, scholars thought that maybe Matthew, who was probably the one to record the Lord's Prayer first, and then Luke also, may have made the term up. Until 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And among the shards of pottery and the scraps of papyrus and parchment that were found, what they discovered was a shopping list, evidently from a housewife who listed what she needed from the market that day. And Jesus' word for daily bread was on that shopping list. The designation of a certain category of items that she needed to purchase every single day. Because without preservatives, which they lived without in those times, you know what happens to bread without preservatives very quickly. What happens? It gets stale. It gets moldy. And Jesus is reminding us in that prayer that he is our sustenance every day. At the close of a Sunday morning church service here in Florida, actually, the pastor stood uh, before a table with the communion elements, 
and gave some instructions to the congregation as to how to come forward to receive the bread and wine. And he invited the uh, servers to come forward to get the trays of bread and wine. And he looked up, and there was this rather large man standing in front of him, uh, tattoos on both arms. And the pastor thought, well, he must be one of the servers. I don't recognize him, but maybe he was tapped on the shoulder last minute. Somebody could make it. So he gave the man the trays, two trays, bread and wine. And he looked, and the servers turned around, the others, and they walked off the altar. And so he walked off the altar. In a moment or two, the man was back, standing in front of the pastor with the trays. And the pastor realized this was not one of the servers. And the man whispered, Ah, which do I eat first? And the pastor said, Well, most people take the bread first and then sip the wine. Should I do that now? The pastor said, Yeah, it's okay. Do it now. And then, before the man turned around with some embarrassment and walked back to his seat, the pastor said, you've just taken Jesus into your body. After the church service was over, the man came up to the pastor. Before the pastor could say anything, just, the man just sort of put his arms around him. And standing next to the man was his wife. And she said, I'm his wife. And he's really embarrassed. He's never been to a church service before. And he struggled with drugs and alcohol for many years. And every Sunday I ask him, do you want to come to church with me? And today he decided to come. And when we were coming to church, I said, you know, there might be a time in the service for you to go forward for a blessing. And he thought when you invited the service forward, that was his time. And I couldn't catch him fast enough. And the pastor said to the man, God saw you take a tiny step in faith this morning. And in return, God, through me, placed in your hands the most precious gift of them all. And as I told you to give the gift to others, so God is telling you to give the gift of faith and share it with others. But I didn't know what I was doing, the man said. And the pastor said, join the club. <laughs> None of us really know what we're doing. We're just trying to follow Jesus the best way we can. Jesus is the bread of life. And what that means for us is that Jesus is God's universal gift to everyone. And Jesus is God's personal gift to every someone. And Jesus is God's communal gift that we share together. And Jesus is God's most precious gift that God gives to us that we might share the bread of life with others.